Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So today's case is going to be another installment in my Halloween month series all about serial killers. This case is about a dark, twisted serial killer who admitted that she killed people for fun. I wanted to cover this case because I personally had never heard of it, but also because I find female serial killers pretty fascinating. We don't often see women killing for the reasons that are outlined in this case. We typically see women killing for maybe attention, like the nurse Lucy Letby. Women serial killers are oftentimes nurses or women in medical positions of power, whether it be for attention or to make themselves look like heroes if they, you know, want to hurt their patients before trying to resuscitate them and look like the hero. Sometimes women kill for financial gain, like we see in all of these cases popping up of women trying to order hits on their husbands who want to divorce them. But no matter the reason is, I don't think I've seen a case quite as sick and twisted as this one, especially when it comes to female serial killers. This is a case that involves a lot of names, there are a lot of moving parts, so I tried my best to make it as easy to understand as possible, but if you need to grab a pen and paper to write down names and keep track of everything that's happening as it's happening, then be my guest because that's what I had to do while researching. This case is definitely a very interesting one in the way it progressed and how it happened from start to finish, and I'm really looking forward to hearing everybody's thoughts on this one. Okay, so with that being said, let's just jump into today's case because there is a lot to unpack. Joanna Dennehy was born in St. Albans, Hertfordshire in the United Kingdom on August 29th, 1982 to parents Kevin and Kathleen Dennehy, and she was the oldest of two daughters with her baby sister Maria being born two years after Joanna. Kevin, her father, worked as a security guard while Kathleen worked as a grocery store manager. The family raised their two girls in a nice four-bedroom home in Harpenden. By all accounts, Joanna had a normal, decent, middle-class upbringing. She did well in school growing up, getting along with her teachers and her peers. She was interested in history, but she wasn't too good at math. She was active and loved playing rough-and-tumble sports like hockey. She loved music, taking private music lessons growing up. She loved animals, saying that she probably loved dogs more than humans, and that is something I can definitely relate to. Kathleen and Kevin loved their daughters and did everything in their power to give them the best lives possible. They always dreamed of their little Joanna growing up, going to college, and becoming a lawyer. However, in 1996, when Joanna was only 14 years old, she met an 18-year-old boy who just was not good news. This 18-year-old was a fairground worker who was on the run from his home life, so she decided to run away with him as well. Of course, Kathleen and Kevin were just terrified and devastated that their young daughter left their home at such a young age, and so they set out to find her. Just a short time later, they found her at a nearby Milton Keynes Hotel, and they brought her home kicking and screaming. This little stint seemed to be the first event that transformed Joanna from a straight-edge good girl who didn't want to cause any trouble to a rebellious teen who fell into a very dangerous crowd. By the time Joanna started high school, she started associating herself with older boys who got her into things like alcohol, weed, and cocaine. She started to show very self-destructive behaviors. She was rebellious, and she started to really push back against authority figures like her parents, which caused constant arguing and acting out. Kathleen and Kevin did everything they could to rein her in and get her under control. They tried everything from grounding her and taking away privileges to sitting her down and trying to understand her and show her that they are only there to help her. But she was incredibly strong-willed and pushed against everything that anybody tried getting her to do. It seemed that the mix of drugs and alcohol that she was using, as well as a possible underlying personality disorder made this an impossible feat for Joanna's parents. Joanna and her parents found themselves going into this vicious cycle of them trying to punish or discipline Joanna to her telling them, F you, you can't tell me what to do. She started having very intense emotional outbursts, and if Kevin or Kathleen tried to physically restrain her or even give her a gentle touch to comfort her, 
she would strike them. Then the once studious schoolgirl who got good grades became very disruptive in her classes and started getting in trouble with her teachers. There was one time where she showed up to school drunk, carrying an empty bottle of whiskey with her, which she ended up throwing through a classroom window and shattering the glass of the window, and then she climbed through the window to get out of the building. After that, she started skipping school altogether. She started stealing money from her parents to buy alcohol and drugs, and again, she was seeing and dating much older men and women. And at that point, Joanna was absolutely out of control. Nobody knew what to do with her. By the summer of 1997, 15-year-old Joanna met a 21-year-old man named John Trenner. John was living at home with his mother about three miles away from where Joanna lived with her parents. John had been out walking his dog that day when Joanna ran up and started petting his dog, introducing herself, saying that she loved dogs. The two agreed to meet up the following day, and from there, the two started a relationship. At that time, John quickly learned that Joanna was a troubled teen who didn't get along with her parents. Not long after they met, Joanna told John that her parents kicked her out of their home and asked to live with him. But John was living with his mother at that point, and he knew that Joanna was freshly 16 at that point, and so did his mother, so she didn't approve of the whole situation. Now, as you can imagine, it has been disputed that Joanna was kicked out of her family home. According to Kevin and Kathleen, even though Joanna did have her problems, and she had a lot of them, they never would have kicked her out of their home because they knew that she was safest with them. She also did have a very extensive history of running away from home, as we just heard, so it's thought that Joanna just ran away and she really wanted to live with John, so she made him think that she was kicked out so that it seemed, you know, like she wouldn't have any other options, nowhere to go, and therefore more likely that he would let her live with him. But again, John's mother did not approve of Joanna living with them. But even so, Joanna refused to move back home while having nowhere else to go. Now, at that time, Kevin and Kathleen had very little money. They had even resorted to stealing food from the grocery store to continue feeding their family. That is how broke they were. I don't know if that was because of spending money to try to get Joanna under control or if they just fell on hard times and it happened to coincide with these behaviors that Joanna was showing. But either way, they were able to gather any money that they could to rent out a flat for Joanna and John to live in together. Because at that point, it was either Joanna's going to be out on the streets, she's going to have nowhere to go because she's not coming back here, or... If she wants to live with John that badly, we can secure her a place so that we know she at least has a roof over her head and she'll be safe in that way. But according to Kevin, they knew that the flat they were able to afford for her was in a bad area, but again, that was all they could afford. And they figured again that this was the safest option for Joanna. The other reason that they chose to do this was because now 17-year-old Joanna had actually found herself pregnant. So, at that point, she really did kind of need to live somewhere with John because they were now about to have a baby together. By 1999, Joanna's first daughter, Cheyenne, was born and her and John were living together in their new flat together, raising their daughter. From there, they started receiving government benefits while John worked as a security guard to make enough money to make ends meet. However, as soon as Cheyenne was born, John said that their relationship became very strained. It started off as a pretty exciting relationship. They did a lot together and Joanna did have problems, but they didn't really affect the relationship too much. But after the baby came, things got really bad. Joanna did not seem interested in raising the baby and her drinking got even worse. Then she started seeing another man behind John's back, and at that point, John decided to move out of the flat that he shared with Joanna and in with his mother and raise Cheyenne there without Joanna. That was the best environment for Cheyenne after all. But as years went on, Joanna would end up back and forth between trying to clean up her act to falling right back into drinking heavily and acting out of control. 
By 2001, Joanna broke up with this other man that she was cheating on John with, and John somehow found it in his heart to forgive her and take her back. She got a new job at that point, and she seemed to be getting her life back together. The couple moved back in together, and things seemed to be going very well for a while. But, as you can expect, the stability did not last long. She started drinking heavily again, and the relationship became very strained once again. According to John, there were days that Joanna would be out drinking all day, and then she would come home and start screaming at John, becoming physically violent with him. She would start smashing things and hitting him, and just created a nasty, toxic environment for John and Cheyenne. John got to the point where he was terrified of Joanne, and he was afraid of how her behavior was impacting their young daughter. The couple lived in this environment together for almost two years. By 2003, in one of Joanne's fits of rage, she shoved Cheyenne, causing her to almost fall down the stairs. That was the final straw for John at that point, so he immediately took his daughter and left the home. He moved back in with his mom and cut off all contact with Joanne. For the next year and a half, he was free of Joanne. Things became more stable for them, and he was able to raise his daughter alongside his mother and make this a safe environment for his daughter. By early 2004, Joanna went to prison after committing a violent attack on a man. At that point, she had been committed to a mental health center and was diagnosed as having a psychotic mental disorder. She was diagnosed as being highly emotional and prone to unpredictable behavioral explosions. That same year, she was released from prison and her parents agreed to let the now 22-year-old Joanna come back to live with them. But her destructive behaviors continued and got even worse. She would bring random men into the home and have sex with them out in the back lawn and this new escapade caused $3,000 worth of damage to the family's new backyard greenhouse. And I imagine that just her behaviors in general was causing a lot of damage to the home in general and to her parents. After that, Kevin and Kathleen reached back out to John to see if he would be willing to take Joanna back and give their relationship yet another go. And according to John, he really did love Joanna. He described that she was once a sweet, kind young woman, and he knew that these abusive, toxic behaviors were caused by her drug and alcohol use. So, he was really hopeful that if he could get her away from these negative influences in her life, that maybe she could clean up her act. And for the year that followed, things seemed to be better. Things calmed down. Then, by 2006, Joanna fell pregnant again and gave birth to her second daughter. And I don't think the name of her second daughter has ever been released because I haven't been able to find it, and even the book that I read about this case didn't mention the name. But either way, after the birth of her second child, John said that Joanna continued to show no maternal instinct. She had no interest in looking after her daughters. She wouldn't hug them or kiss them. She refused to feed them or put them to bed. Once again, after living together and resuming their relationship, Joanna progressively got more out of control. At that point, she started sleeping with tons of random men and women, bringing them home right in front of John and their two daughters. She started getting piercings on her tongue and belly button. She also got a green pentagon star tattooed on her right cheek. Then she got another tattoo on her arm that said Licking Legend, which was a reference to her sexuality, if you know what that is supposed to mean. She also started to self-harm, including cutting herself all over her own abdomen. She started sticking pins into her own skin and she would make herself bleed. She would yell at her kids and make them feel as terrible as possible. According to Cheyenne, she remembers these awful nights from the time that she was as young as five years old. She remembered her mom being gone for days and weeks at a time. She remembered one time when Joanna sent a man over to their home in the middle of the night to try to beat up John. Joanna would come home with cuts and bites all over her body, and sometimes she would have black eyes from getting into fights. Cheyenne remembers Joanna yelling and screaming at John at all hours of the night. 
She was absolutely out of control and nothing that anybody did could stop her. This continued for another three years until 2009 when John finally realized that he needed to get his daughters away from this toxic monster. There was one night where Joanna and John got into a massive argument while Joanna was absolutely hammered. During that night, Joanna suddenly pulled out a six-inch serrated dagger from her boot and plunged the knife into the carpet of their home while screaming, I wish I could effing kill someone. At that time, John didn't even really know what Joanna was mad about, but this really scared him. He thought that this was a massive red flag that he just could not ignore, and he was afraid for the lives of himself and his daughters. So, he finally took his daughters away and left the home, moving 140 miles away to Derbyshire. After that, after 12 years of this tumultuous, toxic, draining relationship, John finally cut off contact with Joanna. For good. That was the last time that Joanna saw her daughters in over 14 years, and I'm so happy for them. By all accounts, John was a loving father to his daughters, and he did his best to raise them in a happy, healthy home. He would later go on to get married to his wife, Vicky, and I believe they are still together to this day. She was drinking at school, she burnt all her books, and uh, and apparently this is as soon, as soon as she met me, but she was already being in trouble. She yeah. was already mm. doing that sort of thing anyway, yes. so... Um, yeah. Well, the eventually um, the two of you moved out, uh, yeah. and uh, and you started living rough for a while because there was nowhere. We lived nowhere rough to for live. about a year in a tent, um, railway stations, you know, train stations, bus stations, yeah. things like that, just to sleep. Well, in 1999, you moved into a house together, and uh, pretty soon after that, she fell pregnant with your yeah. first child. And you said throughout the pregnancy, she was very responsible. She, she didn't drinking. drink. No, she didn't smoke. She didn't do anything. She she, she had a clean pregnancy. That that's the case for mm. both of the. From, of for my both children, yeah. But then, as soon as the children were born, that was wanted, it. Didn't want to know. Didn't we? Didn't want to bath her, put her to bed, change a bum, mm. give her a food, put her, take, go shopping with the buggy or anything like that. Well, in that. fact, she she disappeared. I mean, these when these yeah, disappearing acts yeah, started, and she yeah. she'd go off, and you wouldn't know I where she'd gone. I didn't see her for a year and a half. We, I, a year and a half. We lived. Uh, me and my eldest, we lived together for a year and a half without. I didn't know where she was. It's been a series of of you getting out. Yeah. Um, and her coming back, yeah, you she, described her as a, a menace uh, and that yeah. her drinking got so much of a problem that yeah. she was at, in one job, she was paid in whiskey. Yes, she was. Whiskey, vodka, stolen goods and not bringing home the money for what was needed for the kids, mm. the house, just normal. No, it, it got, it was, it, it was unbearable. Well, there was one time where she was so drunk that she sort of forced her way down the stairs and, and almost, nearly knocked your yeah, daughter yeah. down the stairs. She system. almost scalded my second daughter, the youngest one, in the bath, putting her, lifting her into the bath, and I'd got in there to grab just before it happened because she filled the bath up, but she'd been drinking. Didn't realise it was scalding no, her also? No, no, no. So that was another close show. That's, that's two. There's, there's... What about violence towards you? Was she ever violent with you? Yeah, I've got she... a couple of punches. I've got a little scar above my eye where a cut went. Um, was it emotional abuse as, as well as partly physical abuse? The mental well? abuse was torture because of, of uh, for five years solid, really. I, I mean, where I was living, five years solid was torture. It was it was just every single day it was something else, and it it was progressing from the drinking was making her cut herself or whatever was making her. In in that year and a half, I don't know what happened to her when she wasn't around, but she come back and. She just wasn't the same. She'd put on weight. She was more aggressive. She was more in your face and just didn't want to know. Were you scared of her? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say scared. I was more scared for the kids. Yeah. Because what I'm, I'm not bothered what happens to me. I'm bothered what happened to my kids. And, and hence, that's why we left. When the knife came out that night, uh, that was it. It was... Just explain that night. Because that was the final straw. You'd moved around. You'd been to Norfolk. And you'd taken her back. And for a time, you were happy. And then she disappeared again. You had your second daughter, I'm not sure said. if I was happy. If, that, if, if that's... I'm not sure I was happy. I was trying to keep the family together. Yeah. The mum and the kids together. I'm not sure I was happy. I, I didn't think it was normal that I should be bringing them up. It's not the way of the world, I don't think. A kid needs their mother, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. And but What about that knife? Night. That knife, I think that was just the break, that was the end, that was it, because I had two kids in bed that night and she's come around and she was steaming drunk. She hadn't cut herself this night and there was no blood, but she was just rambling, talking, sat with her back to the door, like sat up with her bum on the floor and just 
and when that knife came out, all I could think was the kids were in the bedroom, and, and she's, I know she's violent and she's aggressive and she has fights and it's... Did she stab the floor with it? Yeah, she stabbed the floor and the knife stayed in the floor mm -hmm. just, and stayed there. Um, at what point did she say to you, and I, I, I think if this is correct, she said just to you wanted, she wanted to yeah, kill someone? Yeah, it, she'd only been in the house about... That's what, she used to come to me for a bit of normality, I think, mm -hmm. when she got to the point where she'd drunk so much and didn't know what she was doing, or she'd come to my house and just be normal, want a bit of normality, but she was only in, in the house for about half an hour and mm. she took the knife, went back in her boot. I had to go and sort my youngest one out because obviously she was still young and yes. she, they wake up at that age, mm. don't they? For, and she left. That was it. That was, and th that, that morning I took the kid, my, my eldest, to school. She was at the school the, de the night after. She'd been to mine with a, a black bag full of booze and she was absolutely paralytic at the mm. school, screaming and shouting in front of everybody. And um, lunch you moved away, didn't you? That lunch time, that, 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 that morning, get, yeah. yeah, that lunch time, I got the kids out of school. I got my oldest daughter out of school. Phone my mum. She come down, and I just give up everything, the house, the lot, the contents, and just left. Well, I think you've done an incredible job protecting hey, your family. I don't think I've protected them because I've got my face splashed all over TV. But I think that's what everybody wants, isn't it? They want my story. They want to know if I'm normal or not, or yeah. I'm this ogre that's turned her into a serial killer, which I, I haven't. You know, I've brought up two kids on my own for twelve years, and I've, I've now got. a a partner that's you know with us and my and kids adore partner. her. But during that time Joanna continued to spiral. She had a few stints in prison for committing relatively minor crimes like shoplifting, carrying a weapon such as a razor blade in public, a few assaults, some of which did cause bodily harm. But she was released from these charges and was completely freed by 2010. At that time, she was living in Cambridgeshire. While she was free, she would stay on the couches of friends that she had met along the way, many of which she had met in prison and who were on parole at the same time that she was. One of the people that she met along the way was Kevin Lee. 48-year-old Kevin Lee was married to a woman named Christina, and together they had two children, Chiara and Dino. The two lived for decades in Petersboro. Kevin was known to be a doting father. He would do anything for his daughters, and he idolized his wife, Christina. He was known to be respectful and loving, and he was lucky to be with a wife as amazing as Christina. He and Christina worked as a director for a housing accommodation company called Quicklet Limited, which offered to rent out properties to people with limited resources, such as people recently being released from prison. By 2010, Joanna visited Quicklet Limited and she asked for a place to stay. She said that she had just been released from prison and she needed somewhere to live. Joanna was known to be manipulative, as you can expect from someone we've been describing all throughout this video. Joanna knew that Kevin Lee wouldn't want to rent out a space to someone who looked like Joanne. She had a tattoo on her face, she had cuts all over her body, and she had just been released from prison. But she told Kevin that she had been in prison for killing her father, who physically and sexually abused her since she was a child, which of course we know is a lie. We know that her father was a good man to her. She had a very decent upbringing and she just wanted to come up with something that would garner the most sympathy possible from Kevin, and it seemed to work. After initially telling co-workers that he didn't want to help Joanna, he decided to take a chance on her and she allowed her to rent from them. She was placed into the Rolleston Garth estate in Petersboro. From there, the once respectful, loyal family man gave into his dark side. He had always secretly cross-dressed, which back then maybe was a big problem. Now it's not like a huge issue. Sometimes people just want to express themselves in different ways. Totally okay with it. But now this relationship with Joanna, which has started as just a man trying to help out a woman who is down on her luck, turned into a somewhat violent, kinky, sexual relationship. After the two started sleeping together, Kevin would start bragging to his buddies that he had found this woman who could fulfill any man's fantasies. She just couldn't get enough. She liked being hit and slapped around, and she liked it violent in the bedroom. He even offered his buddies a turn because she would do anything with any 
buddy. Kevin and Joanna participated in this secret sexual relationship for a while, though by all accounts, this didn't seem to be something that Joanna particularly enjoyed. She knew of Kevin's sexual weaknesses and she exploited them and used them to her advantage. Again, she was a big manipulator. Kevin would supply Joanna with drugs and alcohol and she would do whatever he wanted with him. So it was like a, you know, a proper exchange between the two of them. At the time, Joanna and Kevin had a bit of a business arrangement as well. From what I could tell, Joanna was able to stay at the property for free and she also would get paid for her services, services, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. But this was along another man who lived there, Gary Richards, who was also known by the name of Gary Stretch, who a lot of people just called Stretch. Stretch was seven feet, three inches tall, born with gigantism, and gigantism is a hormonal disorder caused by too much growth hormone. So by the time he was only 20 years old, Stretch was already seven feet tall. He was a giant, literally giant hands, just a giant person in general. Gary did have a rap sheet of his own, and I believe him and Joanna met during one of their stints in prison. He was a car burglar and a thief, but he never really had much of a violent side to him. But I do believe he's the one that told Joanna about Quick Lit Limited and that's how she got there. So she kind of met up with a man she already knew and they both lived under this property. Now, according to laws in that area, a landlord cannot evict a tenant, whether they've paid their rent or not, until they get a court order. This made things a bit difficult for Kevin since he was in charge of a company which specifically pandered to people who were down on their luck. So anytime someone wouldn't or couldn't pay their rent, he would move Joanna in with that tenant under the pretext that she was there to help them clean the place up and decorate. But in reality, she was sent to each tenant's home to basically make it so that Joanna and Stretch could make that tenant so miserable that they would just choose to leave. This included Joanna and Stretch barging into their units and threatening them and making their environments even messier and dirtier than they already were. I believe sometimes they would move into the units next door to these tenants, but sometimes they would be moved into the same homes as you know, their roommates, basically. There was one man who lived in that property who fell behind on his rent and was having a very hard time paying back what he owed. He would go on to say that he remembered having Joanna and Stretch enter his apartment one day and then they pushed him against the wall and told him to get out. He called Kevin and complained, but he got no response. Two days later, when the man still hadn't left his unit, Joanna came in and held a knife to the man's throat and threatened to hurt him if he didn't leave. That same day, the man packed up, left, and moved in with a family member. Basically, what would happen is that Joanna and Stretch would do something like that to a tenant and Kevin would either ignore their complaints or he would tell the tenant that there was nothing that he could do about it because it was a domestic issue, so take it up with law enforcement, I guess. The tenant needed to figure out whatever issue they were having on their own. That is the arrangement that Kevin had with both Gary and Joanna in exchange for reduced rent or even waiving their rent altogether and again, I do believe Joanna, at least Joanna, probably both of them, but at least Joanna was paid for her services. Now, let's pause and discuss another man for a minute. I do apologize if I butcher his name, but this was 31-year-old Wukasz Slabyszewski. Wukasz had moved from Poland to the UK back in 2005, where he went on to work at a DHL warehouse in Petersboro. According to his family, he was really excited about this move and this new job. Wukash was described as being a happy-go-lucky man who loved music and cards. He was shy, sensitive, and always eager to help others. He had two sisters who he was very close with, and he was overall deemed to be a nice guy. He did have a bad habit that he was trying to kick. He was addicted to cocaine, so that did bring him in a little bit of a rougher crowd. But overall, he was just this sweet, introverted guy who didn't want to cause any trouble. Either way, on March 18th, 2013, it is believed that Wukash was at the Queensgate Mall in Petersboro when he bumped into Joanna. She struck up a conversation with him and ultimately got his number. 
From there, the two started sending each other sexually explicit text messages, and Wukash thought that he was lucky to have found a pretty English girl who was very interested in starting a relationship with him. On March 19th, 2013, he left his home texting his friend that he was meeting up with his new girlfriend. That day, Wukash arrived at Joanna's home at 11 Rolleston Garth, where she opened the door and invited him inside. But it seemed pretty much as soon as Wukash walked into the home, Joanna pulled out a three-inch knife and stabbed Wukash one time in the chest. It appeared to be a blitz attack, which meant that she surprised Wukash by stabbing him unexpectedly. She was much smaller than he was. I believe he was like a bodybuilder of some sort. So in order for her to be able to attack him and him not fight back because we would later find out that he didn't really have any defensive wounds, she would have had to catch him very off guard during her attack. We don't know exactly how the attack took place. We don't know if it truly was immediately when he got there or if it was on his way out, but blood would be later found by the front door and in the kitchen. So it's possible that he was either attacked when he first got in the house and then made it to different areas of the house trying to run away or something, but more likely it seemed that he was attacked pretty much right when he got there and then blood was transferred from different surfaces after they tried cleaning up or moving his body. Now, as the attack was taking place, Gary Stretch, who did live with Joanne at that point, claimed that he was sleeping upstairs. According to him, that next morning, he woke up and he found that there was a dead body in the hallway. At that time, Joanna was freaking out, telling Stretch that he needed to help her get rid of the body so he did just that. The two loaded Wukash's body into a green trash bin and rolled him into the backyard to buy some time and figure out what to do next. For the following few days, Joanna and Gary just sort of left Wukash in that trash bin while they figured out what to do next. According to police documents after murdering Wukash, Joanna called Kevin and told him that a man had died and she needed money to buy a car so that she could move his body. It's unknown whether she told Kevin at that point that she was responsible for this man's death or if she even told him that it took place in the home that he was renting out to her. But either way, he forked over the money that she asked for, knowing damn well that it was going to be used to buy a car so that she could get rid of a dead body because at that point, I don't know how you can just get a call from somebody and say like, hey, there's a dead body without assuming that she probably killed them or something went wrong and this person is dead because of her. But either way, he gave her the money. And after that, Joanna and Stretch purchased a green Vaxhall Astra. After that, the two of them took the body of Wukash, who at that point was still in that trash bin behind the house, and they loaded him into that green Vaxhall Astra that they had just purchased. Then they drove around until they found the perfect spot to dump the body. They ultimately decided on Thorny Dyke, a ditch in a rural recluse area where they were both confident that the body would never be discovered. This was an area that Gary Stretch had once lived in, so he was familiar with the area and he was confident that nobody would find a body there. In the week after that, Kevin ordered Joanna and Stretch to move in with two new tenants. John Chapman and Leslie Layton at 38 Byfield. He had just ordered the eviction papers a few days prior and Gary Stretch and Joanna were moving in to make their lives miserable so that they would pack up and leave ASAP. 56-year-old John Chapman was a widower who had previously served for the Royal Navy, but he was experiencing hard times when he was living as a tenant at Quicklet. By all accounts, John did do his best to keep his room clean and tidy but he would fall behind on rent sometimes. He was described as being very quiet and respectful, though he did love his alcohol and he was definitely an alcoholic. Those around the area remembered that when he was living there, he always came into the store too early to buy alcohol, always having to be reminded that he needed to wait until the afternoon before they could legally sell him alcohol. Then, like clockwork, he would always show back up in the afternoon to buy his liquor. While those who knew him said that he was never, like, belligerently drunk, he did pretty much always have a drink in his hand. He had experienced a lot in life. Again, he did 
you know, served for the Navy and his wife had died, so he fell on hard times. But even though he was never, like, the one being belligerent or, like, disrespectful, he did hang out with a rowdy crowd who were often drunk and loud, but he was never known to be the one causing trouble. He drank casually and mostly kept to himself. After moving in with John and Leslie, Joanne and Stretch used John's alcoholism to their advantage. They made sure to drink with him and hang out with him in the evenings to gain his trust. But like I said, Joanna and Stretch moved in with him and Leslie Layton under the pretext that they were there to help him tidy up the place and decorate, moving in on March 27th, even though the actual goal was to make him miserable so that he would move out. But even though they did try making his life as miserable as possible, so awful that John would be sure to move out, he didn't. He stuck around. He just dealt with it. But in the early morning hours of Good Friday, so March 29th, 2013, John Chapman had been asleep in his room within the apartment after a long day of drinking. As he was sleeping, Joanna crept into his room and started stabbing John with her three-inch lock knife. In total, Joanna stabbed John five times to his chest and one time to his neck. From this, John died in his sleep without a struggle, possibly without even realizing what had happened to him. By 6.45 a.m. on that day, Joanna called Stretch on John's phone, the man she just murdered, telling him that John was dead. Her first story was that she killed him because she caught John watching her in the shower, and even though she told him to go away, he wouldn't. He was a creep. But then she tried changing her story and said that the roommate, Leslie Layton, had stabbed John to death, not her. But ultimately, she admitted that she was the one who killed John Chapman in his sleep and that she needed Gary's help. According to the book I read on this case, when she called Stretch, she was playing the song, Oops, I Did It Again by Britney Spears. That is a fact that I don't want to believe because it just seems so like, ex it seems to be such an exaggeration, but knowing Joanna and knowing how she conducted herself, I believe it. I believe that's what really happened. Then apparently as Joanna was leaving the bedroom to wash her hands of the blood that she had on her hands after stabbing John, she bumped into Leslie. At that point, she told Leslie what she had just done to this man's drinking buddy and roommate, but he didn't call for help. He didn't do anything. All he did was go in that room, look at the body of John, and took a photo of John's blood-soaked body lying in that bed before deleting the photo. Of course, after calling Gary Stretch to say, oops, I did it again, she asked for his help with disposing of his body as well. And not only did Gary Stretch help, but he recruited the help of their other housemate, Leslie Layton. We don't know why Leslie randomly joined in and decided to help, but it can be assumed that it was for the same reason that every other man in Joanna's life helped her. They were infatuated with her. Gary and Leslie then carried John's body from the bed that he was killed in and placed him in the car to be disposed of. After loading John Chapman's body into the car, they returned back to that same ditch that Gary and Joanna had been to previously, Thorny Dyke, and there they also dumped the body of John Chapman. Now, at this point, Joanna has now killed two men within the housing that she was renting from Kevin Lee. He knew about one of them and gave her money to hide the body, Again, we don't know for sure if he knew that the body was in his rental property, but he at least knew about it. At this point, he did know that she killed someone in general because it is thought that she ended up telling him after dumping the body. But at this point, again, Kevin did not know about the second one. And Joanna was set on Kevin not finding out. By Good Friday in 2013, Kevin sent Joanna a Happy Easter card, which she received at the house that she was living in with John Chapman. That same evening, Joanna called Kevin and set up a time for them to meet up later that day. At around 2 p.m. that day, Kevin went to an HMV store in the Queensgate Shopping Mall in Petersboro. He bought two CDs there, one for his wife, and one for Joanne. I guess at this time, Joanna had been very upset with Kevin. Apparently, he hadn't paid her for this tenant harassment deal that they had set up, and she was getting increasingly frustrated with him, 
but he didn't know that. She had expressed to Gary Stretch that Kevin better pay her, but Kevin either didn't get the hint or he flat out ignored her when she demanded payment. Either way, after stopping at the CD store, Kevin stopped at 11 Rolleston Garth to meet up with Joanne. He threw on one of Joanne's black sequins dresses for, I guess, this sexual fantasy that the two had previously discussed. But after he got dressed and presented himself to Joanna, she attacked him. Joanna ended up stabbing Kevin in the chest five times, penetrating his lungs and his heart. Kevin was the only one who was able to put up a fight, and it was evident that he fought back with everything he had because he had severe defensive wounds to his arms and hands. Apparently, Joanna also recorded this attack on her phone so that she could watch it back later. That same evening, Christina, Kevin's beautiful wife, became concerned that Kevin didn't return home when he was supposed to. So, she started calling around to see if anybody knew where Kevin was. One person Christina called was Kevin's business partner, Paul. He also hadn't seen Kevin that day, but he did decide to check out some of the properties that Kevin managed to see if he was there. One of the properties that he visited was 11 Rolleston Garth. When Paul got there, he noticed that Kevin's car was backing out of the property, and Paul noticed that something large was in the rear of the vehicle. After that, Paul couldn't find Kevin anywhere. It turned out that after stabbing and killing Kevin, Joanna called Gary Stretch once again to tell him what she did. He and Leslie both came to her aid and they rolled up Kevin in a tarp, which they borrowed from a friend named Robert Moore, who I will discuss more in a minute, and they put him in the back of the Vaxhall Astra that Joanna and Stretch had just purchased, which Stretch drove. Then, they put the bloody mattress in the back of Kevin's car driven by Leslie, and they all drove away with the mattress and the body. The two cars then stopped at a gas station where Stretch and Leslie were seen on CCTV footage exiting their respective vehicles, purchasing cans of gas before leaving. After that, Leslie, Stretch, and Joanna parked Kevin's car on the side of an isolated road near the village of Yaxley, and they set the car on fire with the mattress inside. After that, the three of them got into the Vaxhall and drove out to Newborough, where they dumped Kevin's body in a ditch. So, the car was left and set on fire at 9.15 p.m., and by 10 p.m., a nearby farmer had noticed the light from the flames and reported the incident to police, who arrived with firefighters and put out the fire pretty quickly. Apparently, it seems that the mattress survived the fire because they found that in the car. At the same time, friends of Kevin's were concerned at that time that they weren't able to find him, so they told Christina about their concerns, and she in turn contacted the police to report him as a missing person. At first, when police started their investigation, it wasn't totally clear whether foul play was involved, but as soon as those officers found his car on fire, they knew that something suspicious was going on. Then, that following day on March 30th, 2013, a local 68-year-old resident of Newborough was walking on Middle Road when he noticed what looked like a body lying face down in a ditch. He saw that the body was dressed in a black sequin dress, which was pulled up to expose the buttocks, and he saw that there was some sort of object shoved into the anus. Of course, he called the police to report this, who showed up shortly after. When police found his body, they found that he had been cleaned after he was stabbed and his body was posed in a way that it was found with the object placed in the anus after death as a way to humiliate the victim. Because of how his body was posed, police knew that this had to be something personal. No stranger would kill this person and then pose this body in the way that it was found unless they knew the person and wanted to humiliate them. Of course, this body would later be identified as Kevin and after finding his body, obviously a police investigation started. They first started by going to 11 Rolleston Garth, where he was killed, though obviously police didn't know that at this time. But what they did know was that this was one of Kevin's properties through Quicklet. When entering, they found blood on the door frame for the front door, which was later again identified as belonging to Wukash. 
It is thought that this was transferred on the door as Joanna and Stretch were transferring his body into the trash bin. Then they found bloodstains on the couch, which they later found out belonged to Kevin. Then on the carpet, they found what looked to be drops of blood from where a body had been moved. It was clear that somebody attempted to clean up a bloody crime scene but it was obvious that they missed a few spots. At the apartment, they also spoke with a man that I mentioned earlier, Robert Moore. He was living at the same place as Stretch and Joanne, and they had both previously clued him in on what they had done. Again, they borrowed the tarp from him with Robert knowing that they were using it to bury a body. Then they told him that they killed Kevin and then shoved an item up his rectum to make it look like a sexual act gone wrong. But when police questioned Robert, he denied knowing anything about any of this. Now, just to pause on the investigation for just a minute. After the murders of these three men, Joanne, Stretch, and a third man named Mark Lloyd worked hard to cover their tracks. They tried cleaning up the crime scene, as I discussed earlier, and they fled the area. But as soon as they did so, Joanna's behaviors grew more and more out of control, and she was bloodthirsty. On the afternoon of Tuesday, April 2nd, 2013, 63-year-old retired firefighter Robin Bereza was walking his dog Sammy along West Failing Street in Hereford around 140 miles west of Petersboro. That previous evening, Robin had celebrated his 36th wedding anniversary with his wife, Pam. So, spirits were high, and he was just enjoying his time, staying active, and walking his pup. But all of a sudden, Robin noticed a car pull up behind him. He didn't think anything of it at first, but he suddenly felt a blow to his right shoulder. It took him a second to realize that he was being attacked, but when he turned around, he saw that it was a woman. It was Joanna. She just stared right through him as she started stabbing him in the shoulders and chest area over and over and over again. Robin would later describe that he started kicking her and trying to run away, thinking that she was mugging him. But he quickly realized that she had this look on her face like she was out for blood. He asked her, what are you doing? And she responded, I am hurting you. I'm going to effing kill you. Joanna followed and pursued Robin, with Gary driving the car very slowly next to her and following them until she saw another car pulling onto the street. Then she stopped the attack to avoid being caught and stopped and casually walked back into the car. At that time, Mark Lloyd and Gary were both in the car. Now, Mark Lloyd's involvement in this whole thing is a bit confusing. He doesn't seem to be really involved in any of the other crimes until they drove that 140 miles across the country to scope out new victims. He was a past criminal associate of Gary's, and reports say that he was enamored with Joanne, as so many other men were for some reason, so he found himself going along with helping to pick out new victims, I guess. But eventually, the courts believed that he was threatened with violence if he didn't help and if he didn't report anything. So, we will come back to that later, but it didn't seem like he was the most willing participant in all of this. Either way, after driving away, Robin was still alive to leave the scene and get help. He had severe injuries to his chest and shoulder, but despite being stabbed multiple times, he actually walked a half mile back home to see his wife. Literally amazing. There, he stumbled into his home and called 999 to get an ambulance, and he was airlifted to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. There, he was treated for wounds that penetrated his chest wall, causing hemoneumothorax, as well as bruising to his lung and a fractured rib. He had a shattered shoulder blade as well as a fractured humerus. His chest cavity was drained in time to save his life, thankfully, because if he hadn't gotten help right away, he would have died from his injuries. Robin described his attacker to the police as well as the location where the attack took place. Of course, police set up a perimeter and closed down the area to investigate the scene. They were also on the lookout for a woman who had a star-shaped tattoo on her cheek, as Robin described. But that didn't stop Joanna. She was still thirsty for another victim. According to Gary, after the attack on Robin, Joanna ordered Gary to find her another victim. She didn't want a woman. She didn't want anyone with a child. 
she wanted another man with a dog. So they headed to an area by River Y in Hunterton, Hereford. There was a cul-de-sac area that was known for having many dog walkers, and there, Joanna found her next target. She zeroed in on 56-year-old musician John Rogers, who was out walking his dog, Archie. John described that when he was walking, he suddenly felt what felt like a punch in his back. At first, he thought that it was a friend or a neighbor just messing around with him. But when he turned around, he saw a woman. The woman who had struck him was just standing there before she started stabbing him in the chest over and over and over again. He said to the woman, what is this all about? And she said, you're bleeding. I better do some more. He begged her to just leave him alone, but she didn't. She pursued. She wasn't showing any emotion at that point. John said that she didn't appear to be enjoying herself. She was just going about business. He fell to the ground as the attack continued, and it got to the point that he was just lying on the ground waiting for the attack to stop. Joanne was relentless. She was on top of him, stabbing him. As people in the area started to come out to see what was going on and to try to go help John, Joanna felt that her attack had sufficed and she stopped. She believed that she had done enough to kill him. So she fled the scene, but not before grabbing poor Archie and taking him with her in that car and then they drove away. At that point, people in the area rushed over to John to help him in any way they could. He was then airlifted to Birmingham Hospital where he was treated after being stabbed 30 times. He had deep wounds to his abdomen and back with both lungs collapsing. He had a perforated bowel, nine fractured ribs, and severe wounds on his arms from fighting back, and he had severe nerve damage to his hands and arms. Because of how quickly care was given to John, he did thankfully survive as well. But because of the extent of his injuries, he was never able to play the guitar ever again, which had been his favorite instrument to play as a musician. But even with all of this, thankfully, his dog Archie was returned to him safe and unharmed. Thank freaking God. I was uh, walking the dog towards a cycle path uh, just down there. Um, I turned right into the, onto the cycle path, uh, which slopes initially when you get on it. And I suddenly felt what I thought was a really heavy punch in the small of my back. Um, and then I turned round. I thought it was probably one of my mates or neighbours messing about, you know. Um, and when I turned round, I saw this woman and she just kept stabbing me in the chest. And I got the dog with me. Um, and because it slopes down and the force of the blows, I was being pushed backwards all the time. So I let the dog go, thinking that he would run off, but he didn't. And then I fell backwards onto a grass verge uh, which is just by the cycle path. And what did Joanna Dennehy do then? She carried on stabbing me. <clears throat> what did you say to her? What did she say to you? Uh, she said something t to the effect of, um, my boyfriend told me to do this. And um, she also said, oh look, you're bleeding. I'd better do some more. And I think I said, uh, just leave me alone, please. Please leave me alone. But she didn't. She just carried on. And what was her look like in her eyes, in her manner? Well, I couldn't really see much of her face. Um, but she was very kind of, like I said in court, very t sort of matter-of-fact about it all. You know, she didn't, she didn't appear to be showing any emotion whatsoever, really. And what was going through your mind when this was going on? <laughs> well, I was just waiting for it to stop, really. Um, and then when it did finally stop, um, I just thought, well, this is it. I'm, I'm going to die. Because there was loads and loads of blood. 
on the floor, on the ground. Police believe you were stabbed more than 30 times That's by correct. John Adenahy. That's correct, yeah. They had to stop counting after that. <laughs> it was about 40 in all, I think. I, I'd like to um, um, praise the air ambulance crew um, that took me to the QE in Birmingham and also to all the, the consultant surgeons, the nurses. Um, I was in, in intensive care for about five days and they were just absolutely fantastic. They saved your life. They did, yeah, yeah, they did. Now, let's get back into the investigation into Kevin's death that was happening while Joanna was out there running around and stabbing anybody she could get her hands on. Like I said, because of the fact that police thought that this was a personal attack, police started to track down the people who were in Kevin's inner circle. So they started with using Kevin's cell phone data to see who he was in communication with, and that is how they found Gary Stretch and Joanne. They were tenants of his. So they used this to track their cell phone data, and they found that their cell phones pinged in the area where Kevin's car was dumped and set on fire around the same time. So police started to try and track down their movements. Gary, Joanne, and Mark had all traveled over 140 miles to the location of these new attacks from where they had dumped Kevin's body. But along the way, they had stopped at multiple gas stations and other places for food, cigarettes, alcohol, and snacks. So, police were able to track their movements using CCTV footage, and they were also able to spot that Vaxel Astra that they were driving. Once they found that car, they put out an announcement to all patrols in the area that this car had been used in multiple violent crimes. In total, Joanne, Gary, and Mark were only on the run for two days. Pretty much immediately after this announcement was sent, a patrol officer in Hereford spotted the car with the suspects inside who met the description. The car was parked off on a side street in a cul-de-sac area, and in that car was Gary Stretch, Mark Lloyd, as well as Joanne Dennehy, who was clearly out of her mind on drugs and alcohol, and there was also a dog in the back seat barking its head off. So, the officers Andy Moen and Paul Hunter, they put on their lights and came up behind the car. As soon as they pulled up and one of the officers stepped out of the patrol car, Gary sped off in the car. And from there, a car chase ensued. The chase lasted along A480 Road until other patrol officers noticed the scene and recognized the car and the suspects and went along to help. The chase lasted for only 16 miles before patrol officers were able to stop them. Immediately, they were able to arrest Joanna and Mark, as well as safely get Archie out of the car. But Stretch started running for his life. But because he was not built for endurance or speed, and given that he was 7 feet 3 inches tall and not the most athletic of men, this foot chase didn't last long before Stretch was also apprehended. Around that same time, police had gone into the apartment that Stretch and Joanna were staying in with John Chapman, and there they spoke with Leslie Layton. At that time, it was clear to the police, as well as friends of Leslie's, that he was acting nervous and erratically. When police asked him if he knew anything about the death of his housemate, John, he denied having any knowledge. However, police would later be granted access to Leslie's phone, and on that phone, they found very damning text messages that proved that Leslie was involved with dumping the bodies of not only John Chapman, but also with helping dispose of Kevin's body. So, at that time, Leslie was also arrested. Now, going back to after that chase. After being arrested, Gary, Joanne, and Mark were taken into the Hereford Police Station where they were processed. Their photos were taken, police collected their DNA and their fingerprints. But this entire time, Joanna was laughing and having a grand old time. She was smiling and joking and trying to flirt with the guards, both male and female. She asked about Archie, saying that he was a lovely dog. She complained about the outfit she was given to wear in jail, asking the jail staff if she looked sexy in her new clothes. Then she admitted to staff that she was drunk after consuming half a bottle of whiskey before being arrested that day. <laughs> Back to 
Now, at that point, she had only been connected to the murder of Kevin Lee, as well as the attacks on the other two men. But the day following after the arrest, police discovered two bodies lying side by side in a ditch in Thorny Dyke, about 10 miles away from where Kevin's body had been discovered. Shortly after discovering the bodies, they were identified as belonging to 31-year-old Wukash Slabashevsky and 56-year-old John Chapman. Because of how Wukash and Joanna met with them texting and meeting up at her place, they were able to connect him with Joanne. And then again, as we know from earlier, they found his blood within her apartment. Then again, as we know from earlier, John was the roommate of Joanne, so that connection was quickly made there as well. When the bodies were originally found, police were obviously scared that there was a serial killer on the loose. But thankfully, after these connections were quickly made, they were relieved to know that the person most likely responsible was in their custody. Now, at that time, Leslie Layton had already been charged with conspiring to pervert justice and denying the lawful and decent burial for helping Joanna dump John and Kevin's bodies. After the other three were apprehended, Stretch was charged with encouraging or assisting in the commission of indictable offenses, conspiracy to prevent the decent burial of Kevin Lee, John Chapman, and Wukash, as well as two charges of attempted murder for Robin Bereza and John Rogers' attacks, since he was the one who drove Joanna around while she selected victims and made her attacks. At that time, Gary Stretch pled not guilty to all charges. Robert Moore, who I had briefly mentioned earlier, he was the one who police spoke to who did have intimate knowledge of the crimes, but he didn't tell the police. So, he was charged with assisting an offender with giving them that tarp and lying to the police, which he originally pled not guilty to, but he did ultimately take a plea deal and he served three years. Then, Joanna was charged with three counts of first-degree premeditated murder, two counts of attempted murder, and three counts of prevention of the lawful and decent burial of a dead body. She pleaded not guilty to these charges. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Mark Lloyd was found not to be involved in any of the other crimes like disposing the bodies. And even though he was present with Joanna when they went on that stabbing rampage with those two other victims, it was determined that he wasn't there willingly. So he wasn't charged with anything related to that. Instead, I believe he was used as a star witness at the trial of Joanne, Leslie, and Stretch to tell his side of everything that he witnessed. Now, after the connection was made between Joanna and all three murders, they still had to continue their investigation to gather enough evidence to actually prove at trial that Joanna murdered these men and that Gary Stretch and Leslie Layton were both willing accomplices. So, at first, when investigating the death of Wukash, they actually found a 14-year-old witness who lived at 11 Rolleston Garth and who Joanna had befriended at some point at the same time that Joanna had killed Wukash there. They spoke with the witness and she told them that after killing Wukash and transporting his body to the trash bin, Joanna actually grabbed the 14-year-old girl and showed her Wukash's body in that bin. She told police that Joanna was bragging to her about murdering this man and wanted to show her what she had done. This poor girl was so very disturbed by this, but she didn't initially tell police because she was scared that Joanna would hurt her too. As I stated earlier, again, they did find blood evidence belonging to Wukash at 11 Rolleston Garth, but when it comes to Stretch, after he was arrested, the shoes that Stretch was wearing when he was taken into the station also had spots of blood on them, which was later confirmed as belonging to Wukash. Now, let's talk about John Chapman. There were witnesses who told the police that Joanna and Stretch were working hard to get John to leave the home at 38 Blyfield. That Joanna told another witness that she would do anything to get John Chapman to leave. Then, in the days after the murder, she was talking to another poor woman who lived in the area, once again bragging about the murder. 
Once again, this woman didn't tell police right away because she was afraid of Joanna hurting her. Then police examined Leslie Layton's cell phone and they were actually able to recover that photo that Leslie took of John's body, which again, he deleted right after he took. So that said to police that Leslie was confirmed to be involved with John's death. With Kevin Lee, the evidence that him and Joanna were involved was very obvious. They had a close friendship, so close that Joanna felt comfortable telling Kevin about the murder of Wukash that she committed and asking for money for a car to transport the body. Police believed that she killed Kevin for the simple reason that she had a lust for blood. I also mentioned earlier that she was frustrated with him that he hadn't paid her for her work of harassing tenants, so that could have something to do with it, but based on what we know about her at the end of the day, it seemed to be that she just wanted to kill Kevin for fun. Then, as I mentioned earlier, their cell phones did put them at the scene where the burning car was later found, so that connection was also easy to prove. Basically, police were able to figure out what happened based on witness statements, cell phone evidence, including text messages and location data, as well as blood and DNA evidence that we also touched on earlier. Because of this, police felt that they finally had enough to take these three individuals to trial. Gary Stretch and Leslie Layton's trial started in September of 2013, while Joanna started in November of 2013. Now, because of how all of this is connected and the evidence found and argued in this case that connects everything together, that each person was involved in these murders and disposing of the bodies, I won't sit here and make you listen to me repeat what they argued in each trial. I believe Gary and Leslie were tried together and then Joanna had her own trial. But instead of talking about each one, I'm going to sort of summarize what was argued against each person involved and talk about the evidence that got them to those conclusions. The argument against Gary and Leslie was that they helped Joanne, a callous, cold-blooded killer, dispose of two bodies, one being their housemate and the other being their landlord. They argued that both men had every opportunity to distance themselves from Joanna and her crimes, but instead they both chose to go along with them. The judge knew that Leslie was involved with disposing of two men, while Stretch was involved in pretty much everything that Joanna was up to. When it came to the attacks on the two men, Robin Bereza and John Rogers, the main thing prosecutors had to show the motive and how the other men were involved was testimony from Mark Lloyd. He basically told the courts what we discussed earlier, how Gary was willingly driving Joanna around, scoping out victims. She said that she wanted to kill a man at random because she wanted blood. That was it. After stabbing Robin only a few times, it seemed that the only reason she stopped was because a car had pulled onto the street and she didn't want to be caught right away. Mark also said that Gary did not act surprised or disapproving of Joanna after she hopped back in the car after that first attack. He was pleased and he went along with her after she said that she wanted another victim. That is when Gary drove her around until they spotted John. Joanna lunged at him in a frenzied and vicious stabbing attack, stabbing him over 30 times, only stopping once she thought he was dead. Both Robin and John were present at the trial to testify on the effects that the attacks left on them. Robin talked about how the stab wounds caused him irreversible nerve damage and a drastic loss of function in his arm. Meanwhile, John Rogers knows that he wouldn't have survived the attack if it wasn't for those good Samaritans who came to his aid after witnessing the violent stabbing. He too suffers from ongoing physical disabilities as well as extensive psychological trauma. Now, the defense came back and said that Gary Stretch only did what he did because he was afraid of Joanna. He only went along with her because he was afraid that Joanna would hurt his wife, Julie, and their children. While Gary was awaiting his trial in jail. He wrote letters to his wife saying that the only reason all of this happened was because he was protecting her from the monster that Joanna was. However, while in jail, Gary was also busy writing other types of letters. He wrote a bunch of love letters to Joanna, calling her my devil in the flesh, saying, I can't wait to see your sexy smile and evil eyes. Signing one letter saying, always yours, I love you, Joanna. 
your personal undertaker. So it seemed that Gary wasn't afraid of Joanna this whole time. Again, he was seven foot three. He was not afraid of her for his own physical safety. And I don't think he was afraid of her for the sake of his family. Obviously, we can see that here. Instead, he was yet another one of these men who were infatuated with her for whatever reason, a reason I can never figure out. That seemed to be why he was willing to help Joanna with literally everything that she did. They also showed the many calls and text messages between them that showed how they worked together, how they spoke to one another, and at no point did police believe that Gary was afraid of Joanna. In fact, he enjoyed being with her and loved being a part of the evil, disgusting, awful things that she was doing. Leslie's defense also argued that he was afraid of Joanna, but there was no evidence to show that either man was afraid of her. Neither of them reported anything to the police. Both of them took part in dumping the bodies after the murders, and both of them would leave Joanna's side and go their separate ways only to come back to Joanna and help her again. And then both of them would leave Joanne's side and go their separate ways, only to come back to Joanna and help her again. So it's not like they were with her 24 seven or being held against her will or being threatened constantly. They willingly met up with her, willingly helped her and did absolutely nothing to stop it. That is what was being argued. When it came to Joanne, it was pretty much argued that she killed these men because she wanted to. She was out for blood and for whatever reason, something in her mind switched and she became this dark, evil sadist who wanted to murder men for no reason other than to watch them suffer and die. I don't really feel like I need to review the evidence that links Joanna to these murders because I think it's pretty obvious that she committed them and we do have enough physical evidence, witness statements, and text messages to prove that she's just a messed up person who murdered for fun. There was an argument that she was under the influence of drugs and alcohol, especially during those two attempted murders. We know that when she was arrested, she was clearly intoxicated, but obviously it was argued that even if she was under the influence, she knew exactly what she was doing and she wanted to murder somebody. These drugs and alcohol did not cause her to change so much that she decided to commit more murders. That's just how she was. Now, once the trial for Joanna started, only a day after the opening statements, Joanna shocked everybody. She actually decided to plead guilty to all charges. It was a surprise to everybody in that courtroom, but to those who knew her said that they believed that she took a guilty plea because she wanted more control over what happened, not because she felt bad, not because she wanted to spare anybody of a trial. As for Gary Stretch, at the end of his trial, he was found guilty of two counts of attempted murder for helping Joanna with those two attacks, as well as three counts of preventing decent burials for the three men who he helped her dump. Then, Leslie Layton was found guilty of two counts of preventing lawful burials. Of course, after hearing the verdicts, they now had to wait for their sentencing hearings. During that time, Joanna actually wrote a letter to the judge who presided over her case. In her sentencing hearing, he referenced that letter when making his decision. In the letter, she made it clear that she did not feel remorse for the murders that she committed. However, she did say that she felt remorse for the attempted murders. She said that she is ashamed of the brutality and fear that she inflicted on her victims. She said that that will always be a point of regret. She said that she wishes that they actually died because then they wouldn't have been left with the psychological trauma that they now suffer with. She made excuses in the letter saying that the reasons for the attempted murder was, quote, drunken cruelty, plain and simple, compelled by my lack of respect for human life. During her time in jail, she did see multiple psychologists who evaluated her mental state. During that time, the reason she gave was that she murdered to see if she was as cold as she thought she was. Then the more she murdered, the more she got a taste for it. It was a fetish for her and she said that she was sadistic. She said that she was proud and happy to call herself a serial killer. The judge pointed out how her first victim, she only stabbed once in the chest. She progressed from there until she committed that frenzied attack on John Rogers, stabbing him over 30 times. 
It is clear that she is a very mentally unstable individual and had she not been caught, it is clear that she is a very mentally unstable individual and had she not been caught, who knows how many more men she would have murdered. The judge did not hold back with discussing the sickness and depravity that Joanna exhibits. And for her charges, he wanted to give her the maximum time that he could. For the charges of preventing lawful and decent burial, he sentenced her to 12 years imprisonment. Then for the attempted murders, she was given two life sentences. And then for the three murders, she was handed three additional life sentences. Then came time for Gary's sentencing. He tried asking the judge for lesser sentencing because of the fact that he played a secondary part in those attempted murders. He didn't actually stab anybody, he just drove around the unhinged maniac who did. But the judge saw him as just as much as a willing participant as Joanna herself. So, for those two charges of attempted murder, Gary was also handed two life sentences with a minimum of 19 years served before he will be eligible for parole. For the charges of preventing lawful and decent burial, he was given an additional 15 years to be served concurrently to the 19 years. For Leslie Layton and his two charges of preventing lawful and decent burial, he was given two sentences of 10 years in prison to be served concurrently, and then for his charges of perverting justice, he was given four years to be served consecutively, so his total sentence is 10 years behind bars. Then, as I stated before, Robert Moore was given a sentence of four years behind bars for lying to the police for helping with the murders, but he was given credit for a quarter of his sentence for his guilty plea, so he will only have to serve three of those years, I believe one and a half will be behind bars and then one and a half will be on like a close probation type of situation. Thankfully, the judge did not play around with these sentences and I'm happy that each participant in these murders will be spending plenty of time behind bars, especially Joanna and Stretch, who I hope will never be released. So that's pretty much the information that I have for this case as a whole. Quick and easy, right? I know there was a lot to go over and even with what I told you, boy, there is still more. I did my best to provide you with the most relevant information that I could without getting too bogged down in the details because there were a lot of moving parts in this case. The one thing that I did still want to discuss though is Joanne's daughters. Like I said earlier, we don't know the identity of Joanna's youngest child, but we do know Cheyenne. Cheyenne, thankfully, lived a relatively good life with her father. From the time that she was little, John, her father, actually banned her from going on the internet so that she couldn't find out about the awful things that her mom did. But when she was 13, she actually accessed the internet and found out about her mother. After finding out all of that disturbing information, of course, Cheyenne was never the same. She grew very depressed. She suffered from eating disorders, self-harming, and anxiety because she was scared that she was going to turn out like her mother. At one point, she even contemplated taking her own life because she was so scared that she was going to turn into a cycle like her mom. She thought to herself, maybe I should just end it now, get it over with, so I don't hurt anybody. She said that she was just 13 when she found out, so she wasn't sure if it was genetic or what. As she grew up and people found out that she was the daughter of this sick psycho, she actually had to change schools to stop being bullied. As she got older though, she realized that she is not her mother. Joanna wasn't around for most of her life, so she didn't have much of an impact on her. Sure, she might have some of her mother's personality traits, but they are nothing alike. Cheyenne knows that she is a good person and she will never turn out like her mother. Once she turned 18, she actually wrote her mother a letter in jail to find out why she did what she did. And to her surprise, Joanna actually did write back saying that she wanted to be a part of Cheyenne's life and that she really did love her. So Cheyenne, after not seeing her mother since she was a literal toddler, she went to go visit her mom in prison. Of course, this was a very big deal for her and she was so nervous. When she went to the prison, she sat across from her mother and she was shocked at what she saw. She looked completely different than what she had seen before. 
She said that both her and Joanna cried together, saying that Joanna did give her an apology. Cheyenne said that obviously this didn't make it okay, but all she wanted from her mother at that point was an apology. She said that she does have fond memories of her mother and blames the drugs and alcohol for turning her into the sick sadist that she now is. So I don't know how close the two are at this point, Right now, she's in her early 20s, so I'm hoping as she grows more and matures and time passes from these incidents that she can heal and grow and have a normal life, which for the most part, I believe Cheyenne, her younger sibling, and her dad have all managed to do. But that is where I am going to end the case. Obviously, this was a very sick, twisted, disturbing case. There are a lot of details, but I wanted to paint a picture of exactly how this girl went from a normal middle-class family to this disturbed, sadist, self-proclaimed serial killer who just murdered people for fun. It goes to show that some murderers are born and some are created, and I honestly don't know which I think Joanna is, but I definitely know pretty much for a fact that she was not raised to be a murderer. I think a combination of mental instability that she just naturally dealt with as well as drugs that absolutely altered her brain chemistry and rotted her brain since she did start using at such a young age, mixed to create the perfect recipe for somebody who just grew progressively more and more disturbed and unstable until she reached this level of violence. It's sickening. Obviously, my heart goes out to the victims and the families. Nobody deserves to be treated the way that Joanna treated her victims. Obviously, the families of the victims and Joanne's family will never be the same because of what she and her accomplices did, and I'm very happy that they're all behind bars. But that is where I'm going to end today's very long video, and now I want to hear what you all think. What do you think caused Joanna to spiral in such a disturbing way? Was it the drugs, or do you think she was just born that way? What do you think of her accomplices? Do you think that Gary and Leslie were afraid of her? Or do you think that they were just infatuated with her and they wanted to please her? What do you think of Robert Moore's involvement? Do you think that each participant deserved the sentences they got? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos, especially this month, Halloween month. We will be coming out with some very spooky videos for you guys. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All are going to be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!